Hi, I'm Joel Bapadex and welcome to my studio. It's spring in New Jersey and things are blooming and it's beautiful outside everywhere. So I thought today would be the perfect time to do spring trees um, and blossoms. I'm going to do some forsythia and some other blossoms. Before you try this video, you might want to watch the whole thing through, um, uh, just see the whole thing and then uh, get ready to paint after that. You can go to my website, watercolorpop.com and visit the paint along with pop page and on there you'll find all the notes pictures reference pictures and my finished painting that you can kind of uh, paint along with uh, I have this love-hate relationship with art masking fluid uh, it is convenient I don't like to use it. I really paint in a pure way which means that I just try to paint around light stuff I don't like to use a, a lifting medium and I had I had a issue many years ago this Swiss Army knife was given to me by my mother my mother-in-law many many years ago and it would go with me wherever I went to paint in my backpack and at the time I took some art masking fluid with me and I don't know what I must have dropped the backpack and the bottle broke and the uh, art masking fluid went everywhere including my Swiss Army knife it was all gunked up this really expensive with all the bells and whistles on it all gunked up I was so mad and I swore off using art max masking fluid on that day forward. <laughs> but I do use it occasionally. Um, I did. I was able to clean up my uh, my Swiss Army knife really nicely and it works uh, okay now. But um, I do use it and I use it sparingly. Uh, I have little isolated spots that I use it. And now with uh, um, the advent of a, a magic eraser, which is a total game changer for me, which I prefer to use. Uh, over the art masking fluid, but today I'm going to use it. I'm going to show you how to uh, how I go about using art masking fluid. I prefer to buy the bottle that has uh, the color. They put a dye in it. Yeah, uh, it, it has a little bit of yellow. Some some brands come in, uh, with red. And when you put it down, you're able to see where you put the dots on the or, or the, the the latex on the. Um, uh, only drawback to that is sometimes the dye can actually get into the paper. So with, when you peel the art masking fluid back up to repaint an area, sometimes it has a little reddish cast or a yellowish cast, which can be a real bummer. But if you use good paper, it shouldn't be much of an issue. Uh, they do sell colorless art masking fluid, which is a good thing to use too. Uh, but you you um, so you don't have to worry about the dye getting onto the to the fibers of the paper. But it is kind of hard to see where you put down the. Um, uh, the art masking fluid because it is clear. The way you use it, I have a little bit of, I put a little spritz of liquid soap in this one little dish uh, on the top part here and I have some, um, uh, and I pour it off a little from my bottle into this little well in here. It's still uh, wet from when I uh, put it in before. Um, and I always, um, uh, you pour it, you seal the bottle back up, it, it, it can gunk up and dry really quickly in, in, in the bottle. And when you store it, make sure the lid's on kind of tight and you put it upside down just like that and it keeps uh, for a very very long time so um, they have a product called the incredible nib I let my students my young students in my uh, children's class use it because I know how uh, children can be with brushes and they can really wreck a uh, brush because if you're not careful this latex this liquid latex will dry in your brush and it will gunk up your brush and you can uh, ruin a brush the incredible nib is kind of like a hard sponge and it has a point and a broadside on it and you're able to paint a pretty decent shape with it and I was um, I was impressed with uh, uh, recently with, with some with some of the children in my class were doing with um, you know that 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 incredible nib um, but if you're like me I prefer to have a really good uh, tool when I paint a, uh, you know a good point on my brush so that I can paint just like I would normally paint when I do a painting so with a, a good number six round um, you wet it a little bit and then just dip it into your soap and just soap up the brush you'll see a little bit of uh, you'll see a little bit of suds going on it which is good you don't want it to be overly soapy nor do you want it to be overly wet and then you know you know wipe off some of the excess that soap will prevent the art masking fluid from sticking to the hairs of your brush and then you just paint like you would um, uh, uh, positively normally so I got most of this done already but I'm going to put a, a few more spiky uh, uh, forsythia branches and you can see that you can get uh, you can paint quickly a whole broad area or you could do tiny little details with it 
you can paint just about anything that you would, um, uh, you know, in, in, in normally in, in watercolor using. And I go about five minutes, and then after five minutes, I like to stop. I rinse the brush out, get some more soap in it, make sure uh, you'll see like little uh, little gobs of um, of uh, latex in the brush, but they come right out easy because we use the uh, soap on earlier. And then if I have to paint a little longer, I go through the process again, re-soap the brush, get rid of the excess water, start dipping into the thing there, and just you know uh, finish the painting. And when you're completely done, completely clean the brush out. And here you see my brush is unharmed and uh, ready for painting. Just rinse the soap out and you're all, all set. Now, um, you don't want to, you want to make sure that your uh, liquid latex, the art masking fluid, is completely dry before you start hitting it with paint. Uh, think about it. If, if there was a wet area and you took your brush, your good brush for uh, painting, and you hit that latex, you're going to gunk up your brush. So you've got to make sure it's uh, dry. And the way to do that um, is you, I can see I just tapped it and I got some art masking fluid. So obviously that area is wet, and I know there's more. Uh, you could use the hair dryer on it. But be careful not to put excessive heat on it. I have actually baked this stuff into the paper, um, wrecking the paper, wrecking the whole painting and everything. And that was not cool. So um, if you dry it, just a gentle dry. And then every now and then you touch it with the back of your hand. And if any latex comes up, you know that the, um, uh, the, uh, the product hasn't dried yet. I always have a piece of paper uh, that I, a piece of scrap that I put out on my table. I can test my color before I go to the painting, and you should do that. Make that a habit. I always have this little test paper here, and it's, and it's a good idea to keep it the same type of paper that you're painting on. It would be kind of a, um, a problem if you had a hot surface paper, a smooth paper, and then you're working on a rough sheet. It might look differently on the hot than it does. Or it might dry darker on the, on the hot rather than on the cold. Um, I am going to do a very simple sky because I have a very complicated uh, uh, landscape picture here. I've got <clears throat> just a lot going on. There's an old saying in painting, you either feature the sky or you feature the landscape, but you don't do both. So if you've got a complicated landscape, simple sky. Simple landscape, complicated sky. So um, just keep that in mind as you paint. So. I want to do a clear day sky, and it's kind of like what's going on in my photograph. There's a little bit of clouds and stuff, but I'm going to make it a clear, uh, uh, sunny day. So uh, the sun, and I always identify where the position of the sun is. The position of the sun is off to the, to the right in my picture. Um, so all my shadows are on the left of objects, and, and I want a progression in my sky. The skies at the apex of the sky, the top of the sky, is always very dark. And then as you look towards the horizon, you notice a progression. It gets progressively lighter towards the horizon. Sometimes it even gets kind of pinkish or orangey towards the horizon. So you get a progression of color from blue to pink or blue to orange, whatever that combination is. But most importantly, it goes from light to dark to, towards the horizon. And it can also progress away from the sun. So the sun's over here. This part of the sky might have a, a bluish green color. Think of that. Think of it. It's near the sun. It's getting hit. That part of the sky is getting. You're seeing it through um, warm light. When you add yellow or something warm to blue, you get a bluish green. So I'm going to make a progression from Windsor blue green shade to cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is a true blue. So I'm also going to try to get a color that goes from slightly greenish to more of a true blue, from right to left, and from dark to light towards the horizon. So that's the I, that's the plan anyway. Um, as always. Before I start uh, any sky or any picture, I just take clear water and go over the entire landscape. Get the paper soaking wet. This uh, breaks down the fibers of the paper. More importantly, it gets your whole arm um, moving and might even remove some of the, um, uh, maybe I transferred a little oil from my hand um, in, in, in the in, in the painting, uh, as I was drawing rather, or any dirt I might have transferred from my hand. Now I'm taking Windsor Blue Green Shade, and you can see that it does have a little bit of a greenish cast to it. 
I'm going to take this color and in the area that's closer to the sky, I'm going to drop that in and even sprinkle it in or pour it on. And then in the area where we're away from the sun, I'm going to take, and you can see the difference between the two colors on my palette here, the cobalt blue is more of a true blue. And I want these to meet. But I don't want there to be that abrupt line between the two of them. So I am going to manipulate the board, the paper, so we get a nice uh, progression. I'll pour it this way. Notice that I haven't stopped the sky at the tree line. I painted right over where the trees are going to be. I want to get the feeling that the sky continues on beyond the, uh, the line of the trees. I, it's a pet peeve of mine when, I'm, uh, when I teach in my classes and I, and I see somebody that's uh, working on a landscape and they, um, they kind of stop the sky right where the trees end. And then when the uh, paintings and the sky's dried and they start to put the, some of the lighter values on in the landscape, you see this line in here. And to me, that's, a, that's a, um, an effect killer, you know. Um, it looks like it's a... Uh, it looks like it's more of the cobalt blue, so I'm going to let some of the uh, a Windsor blue green shade pour into the cobalt a little bit more and try to get a better transition in there. I'm going to hold the paper um, this way so that it gets lighter in that area and a little darker along that edge. Remember, it's not a painting about the sky. This one is going to be about the landscape. So. Um, and it's amazing to me, you know, the more we force our will on these pictures, <laughs> um, you know, trying to, to get it to do exactly what we want it to do, the less it does what we want it to do. And I've often found that sometimes I just put some stuff in and, you know, it might not be absolutely perfect. And I come back and it's dried in a really, really nice way. There's a road in the, in the front here and that kind of has a, a pinkish cast. So I'm going to take a little bit of gray. And a red color, it doesn't matter, a lizard. And uh, a lot of water, and just hit the road so that it's not paper white. Okay. The problem with these um, the thinner sheets of paper is that they do, it does buckle. And I like to just move my, my bullnose uh, clamps around a little bit to flatten the surface out. Um, and also I like to take my um, tissue and just clean up the clamps as I paint so that any of the water that might be on the clamp doesn't back run and cause a bloom or stain on the paper. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to hit the hair dryer on that. What to do next, right? Um, what I my thinking was is that I'm going to start with the house because I want there to be some edges. I, normally, I would like a lost edge as the house, as the little pump house goes up into the tree. Because if you look at the roof of the pump house, and then you look at the side of the tree, it's almost the same color. And in fact, it's probably made of the same material. That's called a lost edge. We have a found edge where the shadows begin, and that separates the tree from the house. But there is these lost edges in here. But I think I'd like to keep an edge for the most part on the house. And then I'm going to immediately jump into the into this uh, Japanese maple. And I'm going to let some of the color from the house bleed into the maple into this area. And I'm going to bring it up here, paint my maple shape, uh, shape. And then while that begins to hold a little bit of an edge, I'm going to do a little wet and wet thing. And I'm going to go right up into my, uh, my evergreen trees up at the top and let some of the washes kind of bleed together in that area and I'll continue right painting over my blossoms and then I'll continue left and by that time there should have been an edge on my building here because it will have dried a little bit that's the thinking anyway I'm gonna grab a half inch flat my building is made of a, 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 a mostly wood there's stone on the bottom part of it you can't see it because it's in shadow and I'm gonna mix up a, a warm gray because it is in sunlight so I'm going to take ivory black. Ivory black is neutral out of the tube. We make it either cool or warm in temperature by the addition of blue to make it cool. 
in the addition of orange and red to make it warm. And you can see right away that my color is now a warm gray. Um, parts of the building, parts of the roof that perhaps face the sky are on the cool side. So I'm going to have more cobalt blue into my gray, my ivory black. And then I got this other color right in here that I'm going to use for the warm parts. So you go up into the, the steeple, uh, there's a little wind vane or something that's kind of greenish. I'll just run a quick line going up. And then as we go into the, the tower part, oops, you know the paper's a little wet, uh, wet in that area. Okay, now there's a plane in that steeple that might be uh, more directly facing the sunlight, so I'm going to switch over to a cool tone. There's definitely a wooden part to it that looks uh, uh, very warm. So I'll take some red light and some orange, hit that area in there. You can see that the color warms up right away. This part of the roof is really starting to get hit with a the influence of the sky in it, perhaps. So I'll make that a bluish gray. And my, my value is fairly light. I want it to look like a sunlight value, so I'm not going too dark on it. And then I got a chimney in there. Gonna grab a little uh, red mixed with some of my gray. And back to the bluish gray for the rest of the roof. And I love when a little bit of that red color kind of floats into the building. And I'm not too worried about down here because I know later on I'm going to get way darker with the shadow. Now I'm going to go right into the into the Japanese maple. Gonna take some cadmium uh, red deep, a little alizarin. I want to make a, an interesting bottom edge to the to the tree. So sometimes I you'll see me scraping the brush this way. I'm gonna let some of that red color f bleed into the house and just hope for the best. It has a spreading shape. You know, sometimes trees like a, a maple, they're said to have a um, an egg or an, uh, an egg shape. Some oaks are more uh, uh, ball or sphere shaped. This is a tree that has a spreading shape. It has no discernible shape. It just kind of spreads out in different directions. But whatever you do, when you're painting a tree that has a spreading shape like this uh, this tree does, you want to make sure that it, whatever you do on the one side of the tree makes it look like it's balanced on the other side so uh, the tree can stand. Sometimes you'll notice that I'm scraping the brush on the side and other times I'm using that little corner of the brush to paint a smaller leaf shape. Look how I'm holding the brush way at the end. It's uncomfortable to do that, but it does produce a more unpredictable shape. And that's what we want. You 
you know when we're using these colors today we're going to be using some uh, these reds and violets and and into the yellows for our forsythia and you think when the paint is wet how bright it is and you think you're good and you even test it on the paper here and you go oh that looks really good and then when the painting dries you find out that the color you had too much water in it it just looked more intense when it was wet that is a little bit of a frustrating thing about watercolor you almost got to put in more paint sometimes than you than you think you, you need I'd rather be I'd rather be richer in color than have the value wrong now I got some of the evergreens above it I pre mix my greens I'll talk about that in future videos but for right now to mix a very convincing vegetable green all you really need to use is cadmium lemon yellow not lemon yellow but cadmium lemon yellow and French ultramarine and if you want to make it look like a, a sunlight color you add more yellow and if you want to make it look like a shadow color you add more blue I've got my since I got this premix and I also like to tiny I like to add just a tiny bit of red don't overdo this because your green will uh, brown out and I don't want to do that although I made a nice shape in here where my uh, maple began and the papers wet I'm gonna lose some of those colors but I think it's worth it this is after all why we paint in watercolor right is to let the paint kind of bleed and kind of run together is really kind of nice when when that happens in the right way and I think I'm getting a nice edge there's nothing more satisfying than to fuse two colors together like like I'm doing right now okay. and now I've um, got a different kind of a tree so I, I want to notice on this evergreen how do the branches grow it seems towards the bottom of this tree the branches are growing more horizontal out from the trunk of the tree and at the top they kind of grow out more diagonal the very top they grow out very more diagonal get rid of the, those bits of white so I got the trunk of the tree it gets narrow as you go to the top now I'm going to be holding the brush way at the end The branches up here are kind of growing more diagonal up or, or even on a curve. Sometimes just for variety, I like to just scrape the brush on the side. And my paper has a little bit of a tooth. So I got a nice edge on that tree shape. Please don't make the same branch evenly paced going down, um, e you know, evenly spaced going down the side of the tree. I varied my shapes, my thicknesses, and even their spacing I have varied. There's a couple of sky holes, the sky holes where you're able to look through the, the uh, tree and see this, see the sky. There's a couple in there, and I got a couple I'm going to hang on to, but other than that, it's fairly densely um, uh, uh, filled with fo foliage. Now I want to make sure I keep this edge down here wet because when I, when I get to it in a moment I want there to be a lost edge. I'm going to make this tree a little shorter. 
Again, I'm taking notice of how the branches are growing at the top. Okay, now there's a color switch going on here as we go towards the right. There's some uh, springtime trees, and they're just getting, um, uh, I, I think in the spring, they look a little, have like they have a little bit more phthalo, and, and, and they're a little bit lighter than valley than at the height of the um, season, the summer season, when they get a little uh, less phthalo looking and a little darker in value. So I'm going to take a little extra phthalo mixed in with some of my cadmium lemon. And this looks like a pretty decent color for some of that early spring growth. Now my uh, maple down here seems to have dried. Uh, that's okay, you know, we're not going to get that nice lost edge as I had going through here. Um, we'll have more of an edge, so I'm going to try just try to carefully paint right up to the edge of that uh, red part. load up my brush I want the I want there to be nice texture where the tree uh, meets the sky and I have too much liquid in my paintbrush right now so I want to extract a little bit of the paint so I dip it in a paper towel so I'm extracting some paint yes but I'm mainly extracting extra water and I got some nice shapes in here and I'm going to scrape the brush again on the side and just kind of hope for the best and I lift up at the end Now I have some trees in here that haven't quite uh, got much uh, uh, foliage on them, so they're still in the winter um, appearance. So I'm going to go back to my ivory black, a good combination that I've found that works for me for the wintertime trees. The um, I don't use brown, I, I use combinations of red and orange to mix my, uh, my uh, uh, tree color, so that's a good color right in here. And so wherever there's some trees that haven't turned yet, I put in some of that brownish tone. You'll notice that I covered up the forsythia, and you can start to see uh, where that R masking fluid is starting to come through. Maybe it gets greener in here. You know, I went through all that time to paint a nice shape in those trees, so make sure you cover up and get the contrast going around the evergreens. Uh, rather the forsythia. Otherwise, you know, if you left something unpainted there, it just looks like white paper. What was the point of putting the art masking fluid down? And then we're going to go into um, back to that spring color. I got that nice little shot of brown in there. I'd like to repeat that again somewhere in there. So back to the cadmium lemon yellow with a little phthalo. And then back to that brown. Rinse my brush out. Grab that brown tone. And then maybe on the top here, there's some more leaves and trees. You know, these little errant drops, just grab a tissue quickly when you see that happen. 
and just dab them up quickly if you wait too long. So I always like to say you're going to have to put a pair of wings on them and make them a bird. And now I got another uh, evergreen back there, so I'll grab the darker green. The only difference is between these colors, it's not really a shadow tone, it's just a, a green that I've put way more ultramarine blue into. Evergreens are, are a little darker in value in the light than your deciduous trees and a little bluer in color. Now the house has dried and so is the edge of that uh, evergreen tree. So I'm going to start over here and I'm going to be coming in with uh, similar to a color like that. A lot of the trees in here haven't turned yet. There are little shots of green. So as the paper's well, I'll float it in there. And then when I get to this point, I'm going to pull out of this wet wash that I'm going to mask from here to here. I'm going to pull some branches out so there's lost opportunities for some lost edges. So pre-mix some paint beforehand. I want to have enough paint to cover the entire area. Cadmium red light. Cadmium orange. Maybe for the trees way into the distance they can get more towards the violet part of the color spectrum. So I'm taking a little bit of alizarin for that little distant trees back in there. Because I have more yellow up here for the closer trees it'll appear like this grouping is uh, closer to the viewer. And because I have more violet It'll look like that area is uh, further behind, further back. Again, I'm scraping the brush on the side to get a nice shape uh, for the edge of the tree line as it as it meets the sky. I'm going to grab some leftover green. I'm not fussing about what's back in here. I'm trying to make this this whole picture simple masses in the background for now. That comes later with the shadows. We'll make separations between the trees and and other trees with the uh, with the shadow color. Now this this feature tree right here hasn't really turned uh, any color yet. It hasn't got any um, leaves on it yet but there are buds on it and I'll talk I'll talk about in that in a moment but how we're gonna paint that so I'm gonna block this right up to the to the top part of the tree and I'm gonna stop there the paper's very wet and I want to make sure it stays that way because I got more to do in that area before I uh, before it should dry so I'm gonna try to keep that edge wet and I'm gonna help it along now I'm gonna grab that that pinkish tone, pinkish gray for the distant trees. And remember, you can always wipe a light color onto a dark color, which I'm going to do right onto the evergreen trees, but don't pull back. Because when you do, you're going to draw that green over into the other area of the picture. And I don't want to do that. But you can't, obviously, you can't wipe a dark color onto a light wash, but you can always w w wipe. Or, or bring a dark wash over on a uh, dark thing. Okay, my my uh, tree is still wet. Now here, I'm gonna switch over to a script liner brush. I'm using a number number six script liner. And while this is wet, I'm gonna pull my branches out. Some of the major ones for right now. There's a major cluster right in here. And you can see the lost edge. You can't tell where the tree line ends and the tr this feature tree begins. It's called the lost edge. And uh, who's not to say, I might decide later on to go in there and put a whole mess of shadows on these branches where it meets the sky. But I want to have that option right now. That I can leave a part of those trees kind of disappearing into the rest of the foot. It will look less like we cut and pasted the tree onto the page. And I'm just switching over to a to a thin script liner brush like a number 
two. And now I can paint some of the lesser branches. And when I do this, I go a way, stop, change direction, go a little ways, change direction again. And I'm lifting up at the end so my branches taper. We want to have that quality in all of our trees where they look like they start out thick and end up thin. Nothing worse than painting a tree and the branches get thicker towards the top. They don't do that. They, they start out thick and end up thin. Do as many as I can uh, while it's wet. It's also kind of important to have a branch cross over a grouping so it looks like a branch is going to, you know, go over the viewer's head. And it looks like there's a branch that passes around the, the back of the tree. All right. Now I'm going to do one more thing. This time of year, the trees have little blossoms on, on the end of the tree. Sometimes they're green. Sometimes they're, uh, in this case, it looks like they're a little um, on the orange side. I'm going to grab a little red light and a lot of water. Right, that's a good color. And while the sticks that I just put in are still wet, I'm going to scrape the brush on the side and paint what looks like little blossoms on the tree. Yeah, I'm actually going to obliterate a couple of the branches so it'll look like some, some of these uh, buds, these uh, spring buds are in front of the rest of the tree. Don't overdo it. It'll start to look like another season. You see a lot of holes through this, these um, buds. I put a, a, a green that's got a lot of more thalo in it. Maybe there's a tree back in here that it's doing the same thing. And I like how the part of the branch just kind of uh, disappears into the rest of the picture. Okay, now the next thing I got to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, I always want to, you know, get the paper covered before I get to the shadows. All right, next is I'm going to put some grass in the field. I'm going to put a little uh, grass in the front. The grass color is always a little lighter. It's a flat plane. Therefore, flat planes are always lighter than the upright plane. The upright plane is the tree. The flat plane is the grass. So I'm going to mix a green that's got a, a little lighter in value than I'm using back in here. And I'll block that on. Sometimes in the spring, the fresh growth is a little has a little more phthalo in it. Whoa, that's a little too much. Oh, that's good. And then there's a little patch of grass in the front here as well. That initial wash I put in for the street, no worries. It's so light, it's not going to mess with this green color that I'm putting on top of it right now. And more importantly is I've got a color in for the road. And I don't have to revisit it later other than put a couple cast shadows across the, the ground. Notice that I scraped the brush on the side here. It looks like little blades of grass coming off that uh, uh, patch of grass. And you can reinforce it with um, a script liner brush. You know, just in a couple spots here, make it look like they haven't mowed the lawn yet. But don't make the same shape a thousand times in there, okay? So the painting is masked in, uh, meaning I got all the uh, paper covered that should be covered, uh, you know, uh, with paint. Now I'm going to uh, work on, on some of the shadows in the trees and, and then it going into the forsythia. But before I do that, I'm just going to take my tissue and I'm always move into a clean spot on the tissue. Just sop up any of that excess paint that may have settled on uh, on the art on the um, art masking fluid because it I'm going to hit the hair dryer on this and it's going to dry the whole thing up and sometimes it misses those little specks 
And then when you peel off the art masking fluid, it actually puts them on to the uh, part of the paper, paper that we spent so much time covering. I know we're eager to get in here and peel that stuff off, but we can't do it yet. I want to put some shadows behind those forsythia so they pop out in that purple bush so that they pop out even more. So I've taken a shadow green. That's a green that has more ultramarine blue in it than yellow around to that darkness. And there's a whole grouping of shadow right up through here. So I'm going to block it on and I've, I've left the art masking fluid on the, on the page. I want there to be some texture in that shadow on the tree so I'm scraping the brush on the side. And I'm also going to darken up behind this part of the uh, of that purple tree. And you can see I've made a halfway decent shape along the edge on there. I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with that. Now I can also uh, continue the shadow to the right of the forsythia underneath. And I got all these little daffodils that I'm going to paint later on that I covered with the art masking fluid. I can clean up the shape on my uh, maple now because I'm putting a darker color in here. I can clean up maybe the bottom edge to make it look more maple-like. In the shadow, um, some dark stuff that extends all the way across and under the building through here. Some dark, uh, some dark shadows behind this part of the forsythia. Sometimes what I like to do, I'll do a grouping of, a, of some shadow like right in this area. Again, I want the contrast to make those forsythia pop. And now we're getting to a shadow point right, on a tree behind it. Do you know how hard that is to do without art masking fluid and to paint that dark and make make it look like a convincing shape? It is really difficult, and this is what my love-hate relationship comes in with uh, art masking fluid. The times that I've tried to paint around negatively without the art masking fluid always looks terrible. And it does look so much better when you uh, take the time to, to mask it out. And I'm just inventing a tree in here, but I'm not shown I'm not I'm trying to make a little bit of breaks in some of the branches and then another thing that I like to do as well is just take a, a spray mister bottle and before the that dark green has a chance to dry I like to just hit a spritz on it what that's going to do the cadmium colors they're really uh, good colors and they kind of lay in very evenly which is good and bad and it's good that it's just good quality paint but bad because it lays in so evenly it doesn't look like a watercolor it looks more like a gouache painting by spritzing it a little bit we created little pockets in this wash that are a little lighter than the rest and that I think has a tendency to look more uh, transparent or more like a watercolor the other thing that I want to do before that edge dries is just take a brush full of clean water I got a, a nice number nine round and I want to just hit a couple of soft edges on that shadow that I just put in there but I don't want to obliterate them all I just want a couple spots here and there for a, it looks like there's a little half tone or an area where it goes up into the tree now I'm gonna let that dry before I start to peel that off but while I'm waiting for that let's work on this tree in the house and the shadow on the house we take the local color that's that uh, brown color I mixed earlier with the black and the uh, orange and the red and because it's shadow, we add blue to it. I'm adding cobalt blue. You can even add a little uh, of uh, cerulean blue. I want to make the value at least two, two or three values darker than my existing color that's in the light. And I've come up with this Payne's gray color that I've mixed. Not the color that you buy, but the color that I mix. This is cobalt blue and ivory black. Now I know one thing that if I just leave it all this blue Payne's gray color and, and not make a variation to it, 
it's not going to look very good. But I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to block it in, make sure it stays nice and wet. I'm trying to paint the shadow on this uh, tower part as uh, best I can and make, make it as shapely as I can. Okay. There's even a couple of uh, ridge lines in the some uh, rows of uh, shingles going across like that. I can do the same thing in here. And then I block the shadow in, big chunk of shadow in here. And then before it dries, I'm going to grab another brush that's loaded with a little bit of warm gray color in the same value as the shadow. So I got a little red and orange. And then within the shadow somewhere, Find a little spot where we can drop some of that color in there. So the color has a transition between that cool, predominantly uh, it's predominantly cool shadow color, and then the areas of little wa wa warmth. When I used to paint in oils, this used to be so easy to do because you can do it at any time in the process. In watercolor, you got a small window while that paper is wet to drop the brown in there. And then maybe the shadow goes really blue because of the influence in the sky in here. So I'll push a little bit more blue color into that area. There's a little bit of light that's hitting this corner in here. And then there's a shadow from this maple that's casting onto this part of the roof. And once again, for the color variation, drop in some uh, extra blue. And then while it's wet, take some warm color. And somewhere in there, float a little warmth. But we're keeping it predominantly cool in the shadow. And the shadow extends. Here's a here's another opportunity for a lost edge right up into the tree that's next to the to the building. Switching brushes over to a script liner right now. Don't entirely draw all dark sticks in here. Let part of the tree, there's a little gap in there. I left that on purpose. And likewise, on this tree, I'm keep, although I'm keeping it predominantly cool brown, uh, blue, take a little of that warm brown color and just drop it in along the way. And we might also want to put a half tone on some of those branches, so clean water. Before some of these edges have a chance to dry, just hit the right side, and that'll look like the branch has a more of a rounded form. You can start to see how that uh, form in that tree begins to turn. All right, now we'll let that alone. I can revisit that later on and get you know some more additional sticks, some more additional darks in there. Um, you know, the other thing that I could do is uh, you know uh, to put a couple more lines in the in the roof. So it looks like it has some texture to it. And then I'm going to work on that on that maple. 
take the local color I was using, the ultra, uh, the alizarin, and add a little violet to it. I have some Windsor violet here. The color is certainly darker. I take a look at my sick, um, my maple, and I squint. And when I do, I see the shadow shape more simply. And the shadow seems to go like right into that area. The color that we have on, on the paper right now is the light color of the tree. By squinting, we're able to isolate the big shadow shapes, and that's what I'm painting now. And then before this has an opportunity to, to dry, it'd be kind of nice to put a, a half tone on some of those branches. Clean water. And just hit a few of the top edges. Don't do them all. Because if you do them all, there'll be no structure to the tree. But it does need a couple little soft edges here and there. And that too helps to turn the form on the tree. You know, um, I'm keeping an eye on that. And I want to sink in a dark opening for a doorway or something in there. But uh, it's still a little wet. But I will go back into that. Or I'll try to remember to go back into that. Here's another little grouping of shadow underneath the tree. Once you get the major groupings in, then you can start to do some of the smaller clusters of, uh, uh, of leaves that are a little darker. A little smaller shot and maybe put a half tone on some of those. Okay, now this should be dry. If it's not, I'm just going to take a clean tissue and just dab up. Still, uh, still kind of wet in there, so let me hit the hair dryer now. When you buy a bottle of uh, art masking fluid at the store, always get one of these. Uh, it's called a rubber cement pickup, and all it is is just some hard uh, rubber. They used to use this in um, in graphic design. Uh, uh, it was a tool to pick up the rubber cement when you put down uh, type. They still sell it, and I guess it's just for this purpose. And you can see how easily it peels off this uh, art masking fluid that I put on earlier. And what you're left with is pristine, untouched white paper that we can go back in and now paint whatever color uh, that is. For the Forsythia, it's going to be yellow, and for the Blossom in the back, it's going to be a light pink. That's still wet, so I'm going to leave that alone. Now. I want to fill in, you can see how nicely it lifted it off, make sure all of it's gone. I think it has. Okay. A good color for the Versithia. You know, by the way, that, that's still very wet, so I'm not going to do that. Get a nice number six round. Uh, a Kalinske hairbrush with a good point helps for this. And I have some uh, cadmium yellow pale and some cadmium yellow medium which is a good color and it should be straight out of the tube make sure there's no I had uh, uh, I had was mixing another color earlier and I had um, some shadow tones in for the Forsythia don't use that I want clean yellow and now just carefully the nice brush that's got a nice point on it we can just kind of fill this in don't put too much water in this keep it nice and rich And again, you can always wipe this lighter color onto a dark area. You'll never notice it, but you can't wipe it onto a lighter area or of equal value. Always a little darker. And don't draw back. Maybe there could be a little color variation in it, so I'll jump up to the cadmium yellow medium color. You can just see the slight difference in the two tones in there. Again, I can wipe onto a dark area, you'll never know.
you know, in the way it looks, I'm glad that I took the time to use that art masking fluid and paint it a nice shape. And then we go into the uh, into the purple uh, bush in the back. I have some permanent magenta. That seems like it's a, the right color for that. And a lot of water I put into it, so it's going to be a light pink. If you don't have permanent magenta, you could use permanent rose. You could use any of those uh, uh, violet colors, crimson, lake whatever they're selling. Okay, now it's the time to hit a couple darks into the building. I'm going to take a quarter inch uh, flat. Mix up something dark, very uh, paints gray, cobalt blue, ivory black. No water in the brush, har hardly at all. This is like loaded with paint. There's a, a window back in there. I'm not adding more water, so I know it's not going to create a bloom. And that dark color should kind of stay put. I can even hit a little dark underneath that part, or even go darker into here. And I like how it looks blurry. But yet it looks like something. And now there's also a shadow that goes across the ground from the uh, from the trees off to the right. Take a half inch flat. We don't use a shadow color on the ground because it's a flat plane like we would use up into the, the trees and stuff. We make it a little wider in value. And there's a couple trees. Keep them fairly level as they go across the grass. And then it continues on to the road. And that shadow will go more towards the blue side. I always think a nice cast shadow going across the foreground really sets a nice uh, time, time of day, you know. It was still a little wet in there and starting to bleed all over the place. On the trees back in here, it's like a dark. So we're going to go back to our shadow green, which has way more blue than yellow. A little violet in it. And you just kind of go back over the area that uh, you painted the second coat, although this one's darker and represents our shadow. Trying to make the shadow as shapely as I possibly can. And this gives us an opportunity to might clean up an edge or two back in here that might not have turned out well when it, uh, earlier on. I do like the way the tree kind of has disappeared into the into the wash so I want to hang on to that too after all that's what makes it look like a watercolor doesn't it an edge and of course this shadows continue all the way to the top of the tree if I had more time I would just take my time and you know and know as you finish your paintings you know you gotta that's busy work but you have to do it All right, and then um, I want to do two things. I want to put a half tone on this shadow wash in a couple places here and there. A half tone is just a soft edge, but I want to retain some of the hard edge in there. And then, and again, before it dries, let's do a quick spritz, and that will uh, thin out the wash in there. 
my uh, forsythia is dried and there's some shadows on it and I can't leave it it looks too flat right now I guess so I gotta put some uh, shadow on my forsythia bush too so we're gonna take the local color and you can add blue to it but what happens when we add blue to it I'm gonna take a little cobalt blue the color turns green and I don't know necessarily is the forsythia shadow on the greenish side if it is we can use it and depending on the light conditions sometimes it does look uh, more green than, than uh, uh, warm and then where you got the warm spot, so here's my going to be part of the shadow that where the areas of the forsythia that looks kind of greenish. So there's a little bit of blue in that. And then I'm going to take this color and I'm going to add a little tiny bit of red to it, either red medium or red light, and then it warms up the shadow color for the parts of the forsythia that might look warmer in the shadow. So I got a cool shadow for my forsythia. I'm going to start with that. And as I look at that, I see a lot of shadows going through here. My paper's a little uh, wet in this area, so it's kind of bleeding a little bit. It's just okay. I don't have to do the half tone with the clean water in a moment. So there's the shadow on it, and perhaps part of it maybe um, is a little warmer. So while the wash is wet, I can float in a little bit of the yellow in there as well. And there's a couple little spots in there that go a little darker, and you can continue to, uh, to put the little spikes in there of uh, shadow. Do the same thing on the other side of this uh, of this uh, bush as well, and then there might be a half tone on that. Some clean water, but don't soften everything. Um, this tree is dried, and you notice you can if you look closely at the reference, you see some branches going going through that part of the tree. And I'm going to grab a number two um, script miner brush again, mix up something dark. You could use a little bit of red and a little bit of your leftover paints gray. You know, it'll look like a dark branch or two in here, and this should be dry before you do that. So you'll notice that a, a branch comes down through here, you see it, and then you don't, because some of the foliage is covering it. Mostly you see these branches coming out of the shadow. So you're not gonna be putting a dark branch in the, in the, in the light part of that, um, in the light part of that tree. So in order to finish this up, we would continue to uh, to work on some of the shadows of the trees, layer some of the darker values in here, but don't overdo it, you know. And, and think about at some point, what's going to be the focal point? Is it going to be the forsythia? Is it going to be the house? Um, I, I'm tending more towards the forsythia, so I might put a little bit more detail into those, and, and certainly into those areas as well. There'd be more shadows going up through here, uh, and I would put them on uh, as well. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed today's uh, demo. To find out more about me and my art, please visit my website. It's uh, watercolorpop.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube uh, page. Uh, uh, when you go to my website, you'll find uh, a page called Paint Along with Pop. If you uh, go to that spot, you'll be able to download today's picture, a copy of the finished, my, my finished painting that I did, and any of my uh, classroom notes. And I've got others in there. Um, if you liked it, if you really enjoyed it, please think, uh, uh, please consider leaving me a tip. Uh, no worries if you can't, but uh, uh, I would uh, uh, definitely appreciate uh, your help on that. Please keep watercoloring and stay well. Thanks for watching.